I'm Lynn Semler. And I'm Peter Blasina. Welcome to what we think you'll discover is the wonderful world of computers. As we're all aware, computers have become an essential part of everyday life for millions of people, for work, leisure, education and communication. But what about older people? Those who left school before computers or were too busy bringing up families? Can they still enjoy the benefits of this new technology? The answer, of course, is yes. And as you'll see in this introduction to computers, age is no barrier. In the program, we'll be explaining about computer hardware and software and demonstrating some of the basic operations that'll help you get started. We'll also explain about that other technology making a difference to people's lives, the internet. We don't expect you to be able to do all the things in this video immediately it's over. But with this introduction and a little extra help and time, you'll be underway surprisingly quickly. Then you'll be one of the increasing number of older Australians who have overcome their hesitation about new technology and are now getting a huge kick out of computers. My daughter decided that I ought to be dragged <laughs> into the modern age and she gave me a computer um, that she had, an old computer, and said, yes, mum, you can learn how to use a computer. She was quite right. I learnt fairly quickly the basics and I don't know how I did without it now. I really don't. I just, you know, just ha had a real block about computers because I just thought it was too... But, you know, since I've, I've really had to learn, learn to kind of, you know, kind of not be a dinosaur anymore, um, look, I just think it's fabulous and it's a lot easier than I thought. Kids at school, my grandchildren, uh, all got their laptops and they can use them, you know, automatically. Whereas I'm having to learn, but I'm going to catch up. <laughs> mm, actually, I can relate to those comments. I only just started recently, so I must confess to being a bit of a novice. Peter's a bit more advanced on computers though, aren't you, Peter? Truth is, he's actually quite a technology buff. You may have already seen Peter on morning TV, where he's the gadget guy. I guess I'm actually one of that much maligned species, the computer nerd. But look, you don't have to be remotely technical to successfully use a computer. Far from it. All you need is a positive approach and a few simple basics to get started. The rest comes with practice. It's easy. I agree. I've never been technology minded. I'm still not. But learning how to use a computer does get easier as you go along. Let's start by asking just what benefits computers provide to older people in their everyday lives. It just keeps me in, in touch with, with, with the world, with the real world. Yeah. It sort of created a new environment for me and it set me challenges which I'd almost forgotten about before. Well, it's really opened up my world. Um, I've got an email address now which is, for me, very exciting, and I get emails from my friends and I send them out. What attracts many seniors to the new technology is the increased ability it allows them to maintain independent living. That's right. Computers can often help offset many of the health and mobility restrictions people face as they get older. Well, my eyesight's not as good as it used to be. I have trouble reading ordinary print. Having the computer makes things a lot easier. I can cheat a bit. I can change the size of the words on the screen till I can read them comfortably. You can make them as big as you like. I bought the biggest screen I could afford too. That helps. I can make things bigger when I go on the internet or when I write letters in the word processor. Oh, I can't drive anymore. It's hard enough getting about the house. Never mind into town on my own. But I do a lot from home with my computer. I bank and pay the bills on the internet and I keep in touch with a few mates who've got email too. It's not a new computer. My son gave me his old one and set it up, but it does what I want. They gave me the newsletter to do down at the bowling club. I get sent stuff and put it all together properly in print copies. I go to the club when a friend picks me up. I can't bowl anymore, but I still like the company. It keeps me involved doing the newsletters. As well as helping people like Des remain socially included, computers also provide a ready tool for lifelong learning. They give users a second chance at learning and the opportunity to develop new skills, many of them readily transferable to the workplace too. We've seen how useful they can be, but what exactly is a computer? 
These are all personal computers, or as they call it, PCs. Mm -hmm. Are all these PCs? They all they're different. All, they all are PCs. Most of them look different because they've all got different specifications. Mm -hmm. And what's this part here? Okay, this is called the CPU, which is the backbone of the computer. Inside that you've got your storage device, you've got your CD-ROM, you've got your processor. But most people really don't need to know what is in that. Right. And most people don't want to know. Right. <laughs> and then you've got your monitor, keyboard, and your mouse. So those are the basic components basic that components people would need to start with. That's right. <laughs> and um, these are all PCs, but what about laptops? Laptops are very similar to your PCs, except they give you the flexibility of taking it around with you. Oh, they'd be pretty popular? They are very popular. My goodness. Max, uh, all these mice, or is that mouses? What's, yeah. what's um, the difference between all of these? Yeah, there certainly is a big range, isn't there? Mm. This is what they call a cordless mouse, mm. which has no cables. It's an optical sensor as well. Oh, and, and this looks like it's designed for somebody with a ginormous hand. Yes, that's what they call a trackball, which basically is a mouse that you don't need to move. This is a tr marble ball. So instead of moving the mouse, you're actually moving this ball. Very good for people suffering with arthritis. Excellent. But most computers are still using the corded mouse. Well, with so many options to choose from, how does somebody with little or no experience with computers select the right one? Yeah, no, it is. It sounds difficult, but no, it is quite simple. Most people generally just want to use it for the internet. Mm -hmm basic word processing, writing letters, and they don't need anything high-tech. A simple computer should do all that. Okay, well that's very good advice. Thank you so Thanks. much for your help. You're welcome. Thank you. These days, a pretty basic system that will enable you to access the internet and write letters will cost you around $1,400. And of course, when you do buy a computer, the retailer can set it up the way you need and even install it at home for you, ready to switch on. You should always check that they're willing to do this. Most of us have no idea how to set one of these things up and probably won't ever need to. Once it's set up, it's time to turn it on. For the computer to work, it needs a set of instructions that tell it exactly what to do, an operating system. When we switch on, the operating system activates by itself and it's loaded into the computer's memory. This is called booting up or loading. Switching on is very straightforward. If everything is properly connected and the monitor switched on, just press the power button on the case. Booting up takes a few moments and the computer will probably whir and a few lights will flash. This is like the ads on TV. A good time to make a cuppa. The operating system on this computer is called Windows. There are other operating systems, but Windows is the most common. OK, looks like Windows has finished loading. The screen you see is called the Windows Desktop, which means the computer is ready to use. We communicate with the computer and tell it what to do using the keyboard and the mouse. As you move the mouse about, an arrow-shaped cursor moves about on the screen. You can use it to go to things on different parts of the screen. The mouse has buttons, which, when pressed, make a distinctive click sound. Using a mouse button is called clicking. The mouse is mainly used to select things and to drag objects on the screen. To select a thing, or an icon as we call it, you move the cursor onto it and click on the left button. The change of colour shows that the computer knows this is what you want, that you've selected it. If you click and hold the mouse button down, you can drag the icon around on the screen. I like the keyboard. We use it to type in information. It has keys just like a typewriter. It also has some other keys that allow you to enter instructions into the computer. I particularly like this one, F1, as it always brings up help information onto the screen, no matter where I am or what I'm doing. As well as the operating system, such as Windows, computers use other software programs. 
Why is it called software? Well, because it isn't the hardware. The hardware is the nuts and bolts inside the computer, the things you don't need to know much about, except for memory capacity. It's called hardware because for the most part it's hard. It's the stuff you can touch. Software is the stuff you can't see or touch. It's the programs running the system on the inside. Software does so many different things. There are programs for writing letters, doing your finances, playing chess, or helping you trace your ancestors to put together a family tree. Anything, really. So because it already exists with a name and a home, we've got to click on File and then Save As. It's really great to watch people finally understand what's happening and realise that they can they can work with computers, that they're not frightening after all. This is the first time I've actually learned computers and I've been fumbling, you know, before, um, having a lot of fun. When you don't know it, it is difficult. But once you get to know the basic fundamentals of it, it makes it very easy. It's easier than what I thought in when I came to the class. I thought it's difficult. I always mark up with the computers and they never come out, never obey my command. And this time I'm more... Uh, in encourage and more skillful. I found it very interesting. We have got a very patient teacher and the other people around us are very helpful. Usually what happens is suddenly it starts to click, you find a reason that you want to do it and then the learning happens quite quickly after that. We are learning to put the pictures on our work if you want to make an invitation and things like that. Well, we're learning how to do documents and uh, to be able to write a letter, um, putting headings on them. It's good to try and, and then maybe nervousness goes away. <laughs> I'm learning to use internet, write letters, word processing. This icon is one of the most useful. It takes you to Microsoft Word, which is a writing program. It helps you write letters, papers, produce a fact sheet, write a memo, anything you want. You just double click with the left button like this, and it opens up. It presumes you want to write something, so it gives you a fresh piece of paper. Now you can begin to type. Typing is just like on a typewriter. The main difference is that on a computer, you can save what you've typed and come back to it later, print it out again, or change it. Here's a letter I've typed up, and now I want to save it. You'll see up the top here, the computer has just given it a name, Document 1. But if I want to give it a different name, I can. I just go to File, then Save and the computer will then pop up this little box and ask me what I want to call it. Uh, I want to call it Letter to Dave, so I do. And press Save. Now you see it's got its new name. I print it. Unsurprisingly, clicking File, Print, OK, sends the document to the printer. Then I close it. If I realised I made a mistake, there's no problem, because I've saved it. I can go back in and change it. Letter to Dave. File. Open. There it is. Correct the error. Tell it to print again. And there you go. If I'd thought about it carefully, I would have done a spell check. For that, I go to Tools, then Spelling and Grammar. It would have picked up the error and told me to correct it. That's another benefit over the old typewriter. And I still get a buzz when I see my beautifully printed efforts. Most of us are familiar with the use of a filing cabinet for storing files so they can easily be found later. 
When you set up your filing cabinet, the files aren't just dropped in haphazardly. There's an organised structure to the filing cabinet and folders for different categories of information. The computer is the same. It has a set of files all stored in the memory on what we call a hard disk. The storage system in the computer is just like a filing cabinet, complete with folders. You open a folder by clicking on it to view the files inside, which were given names when they were created. As long as you know the name of a file and the folder you put it in or saved it to, you'll always be able to find it. With my files set out on the screen like this, I can easily find them and do things with them like open them, copy them and even get rid of them altogether using the mouse and keyboard commands. Moving a file is easy too. Here's a folder called admin and inside are some files I've created. I want to move this file called letter up into this other folder here which is empty. There, the file called letter is now in its new folder. As happy as Larry. But what if you want to get something onto someone else's computer? To send a letter, we usually put it in an envelope, pop out and stick it in the post box. It'll get there in a couple of days. But now, if you have access to a computer, there's another cheaper and more convenient way of writing to people, whether it's locally or across the other side of the world. We'll show you how it's done shortly, but first, let's look at the technology that makes it possible, the internet. It's, it's like a worldwide road system. You know, all the computers all around the world are all linked up through the internet. All the information that you want to know, and you key in to that and then it answers you. It's a great access to information. The internet is a means of sending um, communications anywhere in the world, basically instantly. In a nutshell, the internet is a vast network linking millions of computers worldwide. Through the internet, you can send messages to other people who are also connected to it. You can access a vast wealth of information covering every imaginable topic, news, finance, government services, health resources, hobbies and leisure. And if you want, you can conveniently pay your bills, do your banking or shop without having to leave home. At the moment I'm using it for genealogy, for family history. For example, finding uh, uh, lost relatives, finding where, you know, your ancestral roots. If you've never used a computer before, public libraries are very good. They will give you a helping start. If you can turn the light switch on, you can use the internet. And once you get started, uh, you won't stop. It's great that you don't even have to own a computer to start using the internet. Local libraries across Australia and many community centres allow people free access to the internet. And many of these places also provide free training. We have free internet services for everybody in the library, so it's very well used, very, very popular. And um, if it's an older person who's a bit unsure about, um, you know, their capabilities on the internet, we try to help them any way we can, you know, helping them sort of find their feet and encouraging them to use it because it's only practice. It's like anything else, there's no magic, just practice. We're typing in um Internet addresses in the search bar rather than in the address bar. Okay. When people talk about the internet, they're very often referring to the World Wide Web, web pages, and web sites. The World Wide Web, or simply the web, allows us to access billions of documents called web pages. To view web pages, we use a program called a web browser. A group of related web pages forms a website. What we're looking at here is the website of the ABC. So that visitors can move between the different pages of the website, links are provided. Here's one. Links are usually buttons like this, or words that are underlined like here. Notice how the mouse changes from the usual arrow to a pointing finger when it's over a link. This confirms it's a link. Click, and in a moment, we are viewing the linked page. Most websites also provide links to other sites they think people might find interesting or helpful to visit. But without such suggestions, how do we find whatever we may be looking for among the myriad web pages out there? 
Fortunately, that's taken care of by a function known as a search engine. Search engines track down and list web pages in response to a query that you type in. There are a number of search engines on the web, but the most popular is Google, which you find at www.google.com. Well, let's search for something. Holidays in Cairns. OK, I'll let you do it. We tell the search engine what to look for by providing keywords or phrases it can scan web pages for. In the space provided, I'll type in some keywords for my search. Cairns plus tourist plus information should get some results. Click search. Presto, a list of web pages with the sort of information we want. Accommodation, attractions, car hire, local information, even maps. It's great fun following links from site to site, or surfing as it's called. You can spend hours exploring and reading. Here you can even make an accommodation booking directly through the website. Many businesses now allow internet users to order and purchase goods and services directly through their websites, and in many cases it's cheaper. You can even manage your banking, bills and other financial matters without having to leave home, stand and wait in queues or pay counter fees. And if you're interested in shares, the stock market can be accessed at any time online. How's the search going? Oh, really great. Lots of options here to think about. I'll print out copies of these web pages to compare later. You can print web pages the same as you print any other document. File. Print. OK. When you find websites or pages that you like, you can keep track of them by adding them to a list of your favourites in the browser. Just click on Favourites, Add to Favourites, OK. And there it is. The link is saved. A click on this link at any time takes you directly to the page. This makes it so easy to open it again in the future. Now, all the websites I visited invite you to contact them for further information. So if I want more details, I'll do it through email. That's another great feature of the internet, electronic mail or email. Email is communication, easy communication with friends, relatives. To be able to keep in touch, get in touch with people. I remember telegrams was the fastest way you could get to somebody. Now it's email and you can get a response from the other side of the world. It's just fantastic. Instant contact with people. It gets there quickly and you get the response. You can send a letter to your grandchildren or your children and you can get an answer back really quickly and it's a fantastic way of staying in touch. Email is transforming how we communicate with each other in business and in our personal lives. With email, we can send a message to someone's computer wherever they are. Distance and time are no longer issues when we correspond by email. An email can arrive almost instantly and a reply can be on its way back just as soon as it can be typed. Email is so convenient and it's cheap. Whether you're sending a note to a neighbourhood friend or writing to someone overseas, the cost is the same. You can check for mail whenever you're connected to the internet. Look, I have new mail, a message in my inbox from a friend up in Broome. I'll answer her straight away. I choose Create Mail and a window opens ready for me to create a new email. Up here, I put my friend's email address. tpeters at aussiemail.com.au Like ordinary mail, everyone has their own address. The first part here is Tara's initial. The aussiemail.com.au part, after the at sign, tells other people's computers where her mailbox is located. AU is for Australia. Now I type my message. When I finish, I simply click send and it's on its way to Broome. That's all it takes. If I want to, I can also include an attachment, like a document or perhaps a photo. 
To do this, I just click Attach. I'm then prompted to locate the attachment I want to include. Here's a photo. I select it. The name of the file to be sent is now shown here. When I send the email, the photo will go with it. Like magic, isn't it? Sharing photos with family and friends over the internet is fun and the technology is getting cheaper and easier to use. Digital cameras are now outselling cameras that still use film. Now you can see what you've taken instantly and can transfer pictures to a computer directly without having to finish the entire film first and then have it processed. Once in the computer, digital pictures are ready to print or to send as email attachments. If you use an older camera that only gives prints but would like to transfer them to a computer for emailing, you still can. Using a scanner like this, it's simple to copy any picture, even an old family photo, into the computer as a digital image. In the computer, the picture can be modified. For instance, if it's a bit dark, it can be made lighter. When it looks the way I want, I can print the result. Like all files I create, my digital pictures can be saved in a folder on the hard disk, ready to use again in the future. What a lovely photo. And of course, once you become more familiar with your computer, there are many other new and interesting things you'll be able to do. We do hope we've been able to show you that computers aren't only for the young, and that age is no barrier to learning new skills. And we hope that seeing just how easy it can be to use a computer, you'll want to learn more about what they can do for you. If you decide you'd like to learn more, there are many sources of information that are seniors friendly. Computer clubs run by seniors for seniors are popping up all over the country. They can answer all your queries and training needs. Alternatively, there are many websites dedicated to the interests of seniors, such as Greypath, that include advice, help and computer training. One particular seniors website, Senior Link, is devoted entirely to computer training. Of course, we all have our own preferred way of learning and like to learn at our own pace. The training provided by all these organisations takes that into account. As we said at the start, Given a little extra help and time, you'll be surprised how quickly you'll be connecting with computers. We'll see you later. Bye for now.